This conference will now be recorded. All right. Um, so let's see, where, where did we leave off? First thing, um, just a general announcement. I also posted it in the chat box is um, just due to feedback on audio, have your like mute unmute button at the ready. So um, when I ask questions, unmute. And then when, when I'm not asking questions, mute, because um, sometimes the uh, background noise just from people getting feedback makes it hard to hear uh, the general lecture. So just be ready to mute and unmute on the ready. Um, this, this is a picture we're looking here. This is a uh, this is an exciting snowfall in Seattle by Greenlink. This is where I live. And you can see the kids get really excited with our snow and uh, make very impressive snowmen occasionally. Um, we're not talking about snowmen by Greenlink today. We're going to talk about forests. But before I jump into forests, I just want to go again through some general class logistics. Um, so schedule outline for today. First, we'll just check on the schedule. Homework one, any questions you guys have? We'll then go into forests and snow, an overview of how trees influence snow. And then we'll go into the modeling aspect of how do we model snow in, around, and under trees. This is one of my favorite topics. So um, if I don't have, I, I may have more material than we get through, but that's fine. I will prioritize it. They go through what you need most first. All right. So um, so general schedule, here we are today, um, October 9th, the one month class. We get through this at a really rapid rate. Um, so we're adding vegetation. Your critique of reading one is due um, before midnight tonight, your time. Um, really, that means I'm not sure what zone Canvas is in, but if you're less than three hours later than whatever Canvas says, I presume that it's by midnight your time. Um, and um, so please you know, get that in, start again working on homework one. Next Monday, we'll continue working on homework one. And then it's going to be due with the same schedule right before midnight on the 16th. All right. Any questions on schedule? Good. All right. This is this is a lot of text. It's mostly reminders to, to me of what to say. Um, the, the very first assignment is graded. Um, also, everybody who gave me the Hydra Share name, I sent out invites. A few of you, when I tried to invite you, said you had invalid Hydra Share IDs. Um, for those of you who did, I noted this on Canvas in your assignment. I said, your ID doesn't work. I don't know. Um, if, if your ID didn't register correctly with HydraShare for whatever reason, and I think some of it might be due to putting in dashes or you know, invalid characters, um, it can cause errors with saving your cloud computing files to HydraShare that turn out to be really weird looking errors. So um, just double check that. And if you get weird HydraShare errors, that might be why. Um, if you have, in doing your homework one, if you have any trouble plotting the model output, um, let me know. Um, basically, the goal is that the Jupyter notebooks we've provided should have enough example code that you can cut and paste and modify terms for all the key plots you'll need for the homework. Um, you may want to change the axes on the plot limits to just zoom in and look at shorter periods. Um, and let me know if, if that's something you need some sample code for. I can't remember if we actually put it in or not. Uh, I told you the lake policy. I just set it in Canvas to 11.59 p.m., but as long as the, the difference is less than three hours late, I'll forgive you. Um, do, I'll just presume it's a time, time zone change. After that, if you need more time, 10% um, deduction um, per extra day late. So it's up to you to determine the trade-off of whether you want to turn in the assignment late versus partially completed, right? At some point, there's an optimum value of just turn in what you have, right? Um, again, homework one is due next Wednesday. You'll note as you look at it, there are a lot of extra options and things you can do beyond what I'm asking um, in the labs. These are things you can consider for your project presentation. Um, basically, I figure people have a lot of different interests and it's to provide you with flexibility. Um, I'll be posting the presentation assignment really soon. Um, so start thinking about what you want to present on. Um, you don't need to decide yet, but you'll need a partner or two, ideally groups of three, but if, if there's one of four, that's fine. Um, and you're going to talk for about eight minutes plus two minutes for questions. So it's going to be short. And basically the goal is I want you to say, you know, we were interested in X and we did this with Suma. And it can be, you know, I, 
I was looking at you know the things that were posted with the homework that weren't required and I thought it was really cool and I wanted to do it I did it and I got this answer it can be as simple as that all right um again plotting tips some of you are more or less familiar with Jupyter notebooks and Python um couple options for getting things ready to turn in if you can get the code in Python to make the picture um, you can just right click on it and then save it onto your your desktop and then import it in Word and type there. You can also type all your answers in the Jupyter Notebook if you want, and then you can export the whole thing as a PDF. If you do that, make sure that the plots and the text that specifically answer your questions are really easy for me to find, like use some big bold letters or, or something. And just make it very clearly labeled because I'll be just looking at the PDFs. Um, if you're really more familiar with another plotting language and you're like, I would just feel happy getting out of this Python environment and using MATLAB or whatever, um, there are examples for outputting all the data to CSV or to NetCDF. Um, if you're doing CSV, you'll need to export each variable. And so there's, if in the uh, intro to PySuma, it shows you what all the variables are. Here's some examples I think you, you might want if you're going that route. Um, if you like MATLAB, I know some of you on your first assignment wrote that you're really more comfortable with MATLAB, but I'm actually with you. I'm in MATLAB background, but I've been converting myself to Python because of all the cloud computing. Um, but if you're using MATLAB, NC Read and NC Display are really go-to functions for reading at CDF. So here's just some example code that might be useful there. And any questions on that? Probably straightforward. Again, if they come up, just post on the discussion board and let people know. Okay, so here I told you I was on um, Tuesday, I was gonna show you some more about exactly what are we doing for homework one. So this is a picture of Pascal Stork's study site in Umpqua, Oregon. And he was out there trying to study processes with trees and snow. And <clears throat> what he did is very impressive. He actually cut down these huge Douglas fir trees and put them in um, weighing lysimeters and then figured out how much snow they intercepted all the year, all per the year. He also um, had a MET station with all the data we're using. Um, here is where the data were taken from. So this is an aerial view looking down in Google Maps of Umpqua National Forest. It's northwest of Crater Lake in Oregon. Um, living in the Pacific Northwest and doing work in California actually had to fly over this area all the time it's you can always find it out the airplane window by looking for this little like dice pattern something like that it's like oh I'm going over Pascal site it, it's part of a special study they were doing about clumps of trees and what it did to biodiversity um but he, he didn't he wasn't actually working on the dice pattern that's just how you find it out the airplane window um over here was his clearing um if you read his thesis which I, I posted in case anyone's interested is often called the shelter wood. Um, it's just a pretty big clearing where they clear cut the trees. Um, he also talks about a clear cut, our data is from the clearing. And then over here is actually his beneath the canopy site. Whoop. Where did that go? Okay, so they're they're fairly close to each other, not immediately ad adjacent. This is where in the world we are. Um, your, your key tasks for homework one is, um, is you're going to be modifying incoming long wave as as we would expect to observe in the clearing. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is, as I mentioned last time, long wave sensors are expensive. They break a lot. And what Mark Rowley posted of how many um, weather stations have any data, um, this is our least likely to find. Um, so you want to follow the directions on homework 1D and Hydro Pangeo to generate and run SUMA with the observed long wave data, and then again with the Anderson scheme for an empirical long wave. So both of those are basically written in there. You can just do control click, run through it. Then what you're gonna need to do is choose two other methods for estimating incoming long wave irradiance based on other MET variables that are measured, plot them to compare, and then use them to simulate snow in the umpqua clearing and in the forest. Plot the modeled snow from the different simulations, and then discuss whether you think some estimates are more correct than others, and consider how sensitive the model is to incoming long wave in the clearing compared to under the forest. Make sense? It's also written down other places too. Okay, so 
you know, here's an example. If you're curious about long reef schemes, where are these coming from? A nice paper I recommend is one by Flischinger et al. Um, he's looking at a lot of clear long, long wave methods. I know a lot of you also mentioned, you know, I'm actually using a different snow model. How does my snow model relate to, um, to the snow model we're doing in class? Um, so here are, um, for example, the Prada scheme is used in Bone et al. 2013, which is, goes in the VIC code. The um, IDSO scheme is used in several land surface models. The Isioman scheme is the one that's quoted in Liston and Elder, so that's in Snow Model. Um, Flourishinger et al., after lots of evaluation, recommend either Dillian O'Brien or Prada. Um, Brutesart probably has the most citations if you, you look it up. Um, this is also a nice table they provide of exactly like what's the formula for all these different citations. Um, so you can look up background, but we, we provide the, the formulas in the um, Jupyter Notebook, so you don't have to go look them up. All right. Um, just as an example of, of what you might get, um, here, here's a plot of the blue is the measured long wave, the red is it's so long wave, the pinkish magenta is the long wave scheme in the Utah Energy Balance model, and then the black one is um, DOCIA scans for Dilly, O'Brien, and Kimball um, with a cloud correction. The other ones do not have a cloud correction. So you can see they actually they vary quite a bit by you know 40 up to 40 watts per meter squared at times. So you know the question is uh, how serious of an issue is this? What's it going to do to our snowpack? And that will be your um, that will be your homework to figure that out. Um, again, I mentioned this already. This is just to remind me to tell you, um, start thinking as you're going through this about the final project. Um, think about what you're really interested in and investigating further as you go. Also, um, you made comments on your first homework about which people might have overlapping interests. Um, now is a good time to start reaching out and chatting to other people in the, in the class to think about who you might work on for that project. All right, now I'm going to close this. And before before we get into, we've been talking about for your homework. Okay, this let me open this. Okay, okay, okay. Before we get into talking about trees and snow, I'm going to go and show you this very exciting movie I made with me and my pen. And I couldn't do it live because I was afraid I couldn't draw straight live. You know, it's like deriving things on a blackboard. Um, this is about trees and my car. So, all right, I am going to tell you the story of my car on my street. And now we live in Seattle. And so usually in the winter, it's pretty cloudy, but sometimes it's really clear. And our car is parked on the street, parked by the sidewalk here, and we have this big fir tree. So, as you know, evergreen. Okay, so now comes a clear night in Seattle, and it turns out that we get ice all over this side of the car, and no ice at all on the windshield on this side of the car. So, what is happening? All right, well, that's your question. Why do I have ice on only one side of my window? Because there's long wave radiation coming off the tree next to your car. There is, exactly. Does that make sense, everybody? My, my husband wouldn't believe me, actually, for a long time. He's like, that's, that's just silly. Why is there always ice on one side of the car? And so I said, no, no, this is my research. Like, this, this is, explains what I'm doing, right? So, so a clear night, right? We, everything's cooling by losing long wave radiation to space. Um, the side of the car that's open to uh, the sky is losing lots and lots of radiation. And the side that's under the tree, it loses some long wave radiation, but the tree is absorbing it and readmitting it. So it's really not cooling anywhere close to the other side of the car. 
So the moral of the story is, if you live somewhere where you're getting ice on your car, if you're able to park it under a tree, it's a really good idea. You cannot have to scrape ice off a part of your car. Uh, if it gets cold enough, you still might have to, but in Seattle, the tree works really well. Right. This also will help you with your homework. Okay. All right, so now let's just go through general principles before we dive into how we model it. Let's go through our general idea of, you know, what do trees do to snow? Um, and this is this is a picture again from Pacific Northwest. This is one of the lifts at Stevens Pass um, that has just really great trees that intercept lots and lots of snow. All right, so here's another question for you. And if if you happen to be somebody who's already heard me talk about this, uh, you might wait to answer. Um, so net effect of trees on snow. So in general, in an unmanaged forest, do you expect the snow last longer under the forest canopy or does snow last longer in the open? So how many people are gonna say snow lasts longer under a forest canopy? Thumbs up for a forest canopy lasts snow longer. I've got one, two, three, four people. All right, how many people say that snow lasts longer in the open? Thumbs up if snow lasts longer in the open. I've got one, two, three, four. Oh, it's pretty, pretty even. Okay, so tell me, tell me where you are thinking of when you come up with this answer. Somebody turn on your microphone and say, give me an, uh, just a reason why you're saying that or you know, where you were looking when you have an observation. I thought it might be because you'd have more solar radiation in the open, so it melts sooner. Mm -hmm. That's a good reason. Another one. There's uh, less snow accumulation in the forest because of snow interception. Mm -hmm. any, any other reasons? Yeah. Why might I was thinking of the Snow X experiment at Grand Mesa, where there was also, like Maggie said, shallower snow in the forested area, so just less snow to melt. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a reason we haven't heard yet? The answer is you are you are all right. Um, somewhere, both of these are true. So this is why forest and snow processes are a tricky issue. So let's let's look at the evidence. Okay. So as Connor said, forests shade snow from the sun, right? And forests block the wind. So snow should last longer in a forest. So here's a plot from a paper by Jost et al. Um, that did, was doing work in British Columbia. And you can see the clear cut measurements and under the forest canopy and definitely out here in May, there is more snow under the forest canopy. Um, here's work by Kudusalo and Kokonen in Finland. Um, and they have a map of snow under a forest canopy and in a clearing. And if you just draw a line, um, you can see that again, snow in Finland is lasting longer under the forest canopy. Okay. So now we also know, as Maggie and Megan were saying, that forests intercept snow. And as we know from my car, they emit long wave radiation. So snow should last longer in the open, right? So here's a graphic from a paper by Roger Bales working in the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory. And he's got the black line as a measurement of snow depth in the open. And he's got two measurements, one right under the canopy and one kind of at the dripping edge of the canopy. And the snow's gone at both of those before the open because I had less snow to start. So, so the answer is it depends where you are. I'm um, just to think about those processes. Um, I'm going to show you another movie from the Pacific Northwest. So this is up at a site near Mount Hoffman in Olympic National Park. Um, this, this camera was put out by um, William Ryan Courier and a team um, who had to hike carrying poles and rebar and cameras about 20 miles into the wilderness, installed these and created this movie for your viewing pleasure. So let's just take a look at what happens in terms of snow. Um, Basically in the Olympics, we get a lot of snow. Uh, this is where there's the rainforest. 
um, you can see there's um, you can see the trees intercept a lot of snow and the intercept of snow the branches bend down the snow comes off it goes back up you can see that as the snow is coming off there's a lot of litter around here you can see that poles don't stand up very well in deep snow that it knocks them over um, you can see here it rains on the snow sometimes there's little pockets you see things are washed off um, and the, this tree in the background here is like breathing as the snow comes away um, now the snow is starting to melt, the poles reappear, they come out, lots of pieces of trees have fallen out onto the snow. It's got a darker albedo. And then you can see as it's disappearing, it disappears by the tree first. Here it's lasting longer in the open. And then finally goes away and um, you get some beautiful sunny days in the Olympics. All right. Okay, so, um, so you know, we were asking a question when I started studying snow in the Pacific Northwest. I was reading a lot of papers that said, you know, snow always lasts longer under trees. And it was not matching anything I saw when I went walking in my local woods. I'm like, no, the snow disappears by the trees for it doesn't last under the trees. And so um, one of your recommended but not required readings is um, a paper I wrote that we basically went and looked at every paired study we could find where people had simultaneously measured snow in an open area and under the trees. And we mapped them all over the globe. And what we, we noticed about them, we noticed what was the typical December, January, February temperature. So that's the colors you see here. And then we just noted whether snow disappeared the same, there was no difference, that's the circle. Whether snow lasted longer in the forest and the size of the triangle here is roughly how much longer. Um, was it about three days longer or more than a week longer? or whether snow lasted longer in the open. And what we found was really interesting, coherent global pattern. Um, the first thing is that places where snow lasts a week or more longer under the forest, so these are triangles, um, are all in cold, the light blue, less than negative four degrees winter temperature, average winter temperature part of the globe. And here's just a picture, um, my, my Former student Susan, who was a co-author in the paper, says that it's very dangerous to let Jessica look at Google Earth because I will always look far too long. But if you look on Google Earth and go through the little timeline, you can go find days where there's patchy snow and see whether it lasts longer under the trees or in the open. And here's Northern Finland, so that's right there, um, near these study sites. And you can definitely see that in Finland, snow is sticking around under the forest and there's definitely no snow out in the open areas here. Then you can also see, hence my not matching the rest of the globe in the Pacific Northwest, the places where snow lasts a week or more longer in the open are all warmer locations. So you can see all of these squares are actually um, on the Western US where we have snow in fairly warm locations. And sure enough, if you play with Google Earth again, you can go, here's the Sierra Nevada, California, and you can see similar to what you saw in my movie from the Olympics is that the snow is kind of disappearing first right next to the trees here. Um, there's all these sort of tree wells melting out and there's more snow in the gaps in the clearings, particularly in the small clearings. All right, so if you can take the map and you can also just plot that as a scatter plot, right? So um, here on the left side is where snow lasts 14 days longer in the open. So all the warm places and on the right is where snow lasts 14 days longer under the forest. They're all colder locations. So we can say, um, just based on a meta-analysis, that trees enhance snow retention in colder climates and hurt snow retention in warmer climates. So why? Somebody's got to click that unmute button for me. In part, that long waves is long wave radiation is less less influential in cold weather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if your tree your tree temperature tends to match air temperature, and trees will emit long wave radiation proportionally above freezing, the trees will start melting the snow. If air temperature is also way below freezing, 
receive a lot less long wave radiation and the trees will be less inclined to melt snow. Any other reasons? Um, I think the warmer places in the Pacific Northwest also get more snow, so there's more likely that more snow would pile up in the clearings and in the trees. Yeah, I mean, if there's a difference in each time we get snow, bigger snow pile multiplied by three is gonna make a much bigger difference in just time to melt that bigger snow pile, whereas two shallow snow piles aren't gonna change number of days by much. That's a, also very, very true. Anything else? Is there an effect of the type of trees in these different climates? Yes. Like deciduous without yes. leaves, deciduous without leaves versus coniferous. Mm, so we we explicitly left out anything that was using deciduous trees. So the whole analysis we only looked at evergreen trees. So, but 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 follow up on that. Um, just based on wandering around different places, what do you notice about trees and warmer versus places with warmer versus colder climates? Are the trees a different size or diameter? Yeah. <laughs> How so? In the warmer climates, lo bigger, larger, colder, or, um, more suppressed, not growing as big. Yep, yep. I, I learned, I visited John Palmer and he said that in Saskatoon, they have to import the Christmas trees from British Columbia. They have to get them from the warmer regions because their trees are just not healthy and plentiful, right? Pacific Northwest, we're growing all the Christmas trees. Um, because snow <laughs> characteristics, like in the, like what type of snow, like powder snow or really crystal snow, that makes a difference in like how it melts or lasts longer? Um, not necessarily how it melts and lasts longer, but if, if you saw my, if you're looking at the video of, um, of the Olympics, you, you saw that an amazing amount of snow stuck on those trees every time it snowed, right? If, if you live in a colder climate, you're like, my trees never get as much snow as these trees were in that video, right? Is what a lot of people comment to me. Um, and so, so the snow sticks to the trees a lot more in a warmer climate. Um, you'll get a lot more interception from sticking to snow. So I, I think all of these, all of these reasons are happening and they all are correlated with that winter temperature. So, so let's look at a, a little more evidence here. Um, I, I think you guys mentioned um, the long wave, right? With warmer winters, the long wave dominates, trees melt the snow. With colder winters, um, short wave dominates, uh, trees shade the snow. Um, uh, part, part of the reason also why, um, why short wave dominates in places with colder winters is because melt generally starts later in the year when the sun's higher in the sky. And so you actually have more total shortwave radiation that you need to shade the snow from. Okay, so we can, we can take this idea and we can go a step further, right? So we can say, all right, we basically made this temperature index map that says, um, it says, okay, for temperatures less than negative five, we think snow lasts longer under the trees. Winter temperatures uh, greater than two, snow lasts longer in the open. And we have this for a global map, but we can also um, take a higher resolution climatology of temperature. So this map on the left here is showing um, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Um, forgive the Pacific Northwest bias, that's where, where I live. Um, the map is using PRISM, which I mentioned again in metadata. This is um, downscaling method, parameter regression on independent slopes. And, um, and what you see is, you know, finer scale, December, January, February temperature. So we had a question of like, okay, if, if this is true at a global scale, can we actually predict at our local scale that like different spots in one mountain range might show up as warmer, colder, and have different forest snow patterns? Um, so, so we just took that temperature map. So using only winter temperatures, we could map the temperature effects in space and time. And I was calling, I'm calling this uh, delta T, delta tree, delta sui down here in the left. Um, this was me writing a proposal too late at night. I started using hieroglyphics. Um, so everywhere there's red based on temperature, we think snow would last longer in the openings. 
everywhere there's a dark blue, we think snow should last longer under the forest. And everywhere there's this kind of light blue color, we think that right now snow is longer under the forest, but that is likely to change and flip directions if we just warm things by two degrees, right? It's right on the fence. Um, it's a little bit warmer. So, um, so, so does that work? So everywhere there is a, um, there is a gray circle was where we could find observations that someone actually looked at snow in the open and snow under a forest. And one good example is here, um, these are Ann Nolan sites that were uh, written up by Travis Roth and Ann Nolan in 2016 describing them. Um, they did a transect in the um, Oregon Cascades and um, what they, and so you can see one of theirs fell in a spot where we say snow would last longer in the openings and one last where we think snow should last longer in the forest. And so here's zooming into their data at these two sites. And sure enough, you can see that at the low site, snow lasts longer in the forest and it lasts longer in the open, shorter in the forest by quite a bit, uh, more than a month. And at the high site, um, it's a little bit colder, but snow lasts longer in the forest than in the open. Um, you can also see if you look at the peaks that a lot more accumulated in the open relative to the forest at the low site, and kind of similar amounts accumulated in the forest in the open at the high site. Okay, so based, based only on winter temperatures, we'd also see that much of the Pacific Northwest would shift to snow lasting longer in the openings, right? If we took all the light blue and we colored it red, we'd have a pretty red region here. But you, do we trust those? Before we tell everybody, go start, you know, we have too many forests in the Northwest that are bothering our snow. Um, when I first published this, um, I got some some backlog from people who said that I was clearly being paid by Warehouser and I just wanted to give people more reasons to go cut down trees. I was not a good professor. Um, so, you know, is is this true? You know, and is a simple temperature-based prediction true? Can we physically model this? So here is Pascal Turf Study Site. That's your homework this week in Umpqua, Oregon. And you can see that at Pascal's site, it's a warm site. It's, um, it's in, it's in the Pacific Northwest and snow lasts longer in the open. Um, it's And that's due both to um, much more interception. There's a lot more accumulating in the open as well as to midwinter melt, right? That's that long wave radiation. And we see faster melt under the forest and in the open here. So, um, so the difference right here at sort of our peak sweep for the year at Pascal site is 172 millimeters and if you didn't count the melt that occurred. Um, you didn't count the melt that occurred in the open when there was no snow under the canopy, right? If you said this is an unfair difference because this would have been negative at the time this one was melting right here, um, it would be 183. So we could say, you know, what, what's our main cause, right? We we talked about, you know, with our you know hand wavy temperature based arguments, like what processes might be important. But the physically based model lets us get out what, what are the relative magnitude of these different processes and which might be more important than the other ones. Um, and so you can see here at Pascal's site, um, and this, this is actually, this is actually um, we're not even to the physically based modeling yet. We're just dividing this, um, this into components, right? So what is the difference? There's, there's a big difference here, you know, 172 millimeters. Much of this difference is set up from interception. So about 131 millimeters or 72% comes from the interception difference, just having more snow to start with. And about um, 52 millimeters or 28% comes from this midwinter melt difference. So if you, if you read my paper that I published in 2013, I give this really nicely written, okay, I'm biased. I thought it was a very nicely written explanation that says it's all about midwinter melt, right? I really like long wave. I like, you know, how the trees give you more long wave. And I say, you know, really it's that warmer temperatures, the trees are more long wave, it's melting the snow. And I have a very nice energy balance argument. But if you look at this, which is a plot in the paper, you would say, well, that's about 28% of the story. Isn't the bigger part of the story, the 72%? Shouldn't we actually be looking more at this interception? Um, so, so the plus of being a professor is that your your students come and they challenge you, right? So if you say anything that might not be exactly true, it's a job of all the grad students to go and tell the professors to um, fix their erroneous ways. So here's Susan Dickerson Lang's paper 
in hydrologic processes in 2017. And she went and looked at all the sites she could find in the Pacific Northwest. And here are our pictures, again, from Google Earth of all the sites and of how the studies were designed. And this is, I think, a, a, a kind of interesting study looking at this when you think about a paired forest open site. Um, all forests and all openings are not created equal, right? Um, you have an example of like we had one spot under a very dense clump of trees and one in an opening. We had a very tiny opening that we said was open because the forest was too dense. Um, in, in Idaho, Tim Link had a, a transect across uh, kind of this opening. There were also you know places where they called openings like very small, as well as ones that were, you know, big clear cuts that were in the opening and large transects versus point measurements. So you know, observational differences aside, what, what Susan found was that at all of these sites, what we observed at Pascal's site was true. That there actually the the difference was dominated by forest effects in snow accumulation, that this cumulative gain made up the story much more than the loss. That the reason all of these sites had snow lasting longer in the open was just as I think it was either Katrina or Sarah said, um, they just accumulate way more snow in the open because there's no interception. Now, as you're gonna learn once you start modeling, you'll find out that this is kind of, it's good to know this, but this is actually a hard thing because we're actually much better at modeling melt processes than we are at modeling accumulation processes. Um, but what we know is that accumulation really matters. So what's, what's really happening in terms of accumulation? And this is a picture in the background of Mount Rainier. And at Mount Rainier, definitely snow lasts longer in the open than where the trees are. The trees actually um, grow on ridges so that they can not be covered by snow so long. So we need to think about snow deposition and winds, and we need to think about snow interception. Both these things are very hard things to model, but we also show that they are the dominant factor in what's going on. So remember, I showed you um, I showed you these sites that um, Travis Roth and Ann Nolan took observations at, and I said, look, this, this shows that my hypothesis is correct. Now, um, Susan went and looked at these sites and said, well, well, why? What, what's going on? And here again is a picture. Here's the lower elevation site. And here's the higher elevation site. You can also see, as Chris mentioned, that you know trees in warmer climates and lower elevations tend to be a little healthier, a little bushier than trees higher up. Um, you can see that in the pictures there. And um, what Susan found was that at these sites, even though we said that we thought that um, there would be more midwinter melt and then more shading. You're really thinking about that. But actually, this is an accumulation difference. So here at Hog Pass, the um, and I apologize if the uh, the quality of the writing on this is bad. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but you can see that the forest in the open had a peak sweep about the same exact snow up at this high elevation Hog Pass site, and it's much more in the open at the lower elevation site. All right, so it's set up during accumulation, but what exactly was happening during accumulation? So here are some more pictures of the site. And um, I think this is a story that not, not all opens are created equal. Um, so you can look at the wind speed at these two sites. And you can see that Hog Pass open, this is a really windy site. This is up at the top of the mountain. It's a very windy pass. Wind speed is frequently more than five meters per second. And in this case, the trees are acting like a snow fence and saving the snow. Um, th this is a, a hard thing to put in your model correctly, but this is the dominant process we see in the observations. So um, again, it's not, not just uh, Susan who found this and not just at Hog Pass. Um, this is one of my favorite papers uh, by Chris Heimstra looking um, at upper tree line in the Medicine Bow Mountains in Wyoming. And um, you can see from this picture that Chris took out of his airplane window how much the trees here are really acting like a snow fence, right? The wind's coming from, from the left to the right in this picture, and you get these snow drifts right behind the trees that last. Also, for those of you who are looking at the Grand Mesa data, there are some places in Grand Mesa where the trees are acting like a snow fence. All right, so, so just to summarize, this is another picture from Chris Heimstra um, showing trees acting like a snow fence. You can actually see the snow blowing here. Um, so wind patterns matter for snow distribution. 
trees can act as a snow fence. All right, so why, why with temperature could I predict winds, right? Um, higher elevations, which are colder, are likely windier. Areas with sparser forests, which happens where it's colder, are likely windier. And colder snow, we talked about that stickiness, is less cohesive. It's more subject to the wind. Um, so, so temperature was a very good index of saying how much wind effects might matter. Um, so, you know, correlation doesn't directly imply causation, but it can be a really good clue. All right, the other story, interception matters, or accumulation matters, is we go look at snow interception. So, you know, here's a picture, this is kind of rhyming, this is near Lake Tahoe, um, up at Heavenly Ski Resort. And um, in, in Japan in 1952, the Ministry of Japan um, were trying to figure out hazards from snow. And so they weighed trees and showed a clear increase in snowfall interception between negative five and zero degrees Celsius. It's most rapid at negative three. So here, um, this whole paper, I posted it for you. It's kind of hard to find, but um, if you speak, if you can read Japanese or a friend who can, it's really, really fun. Um, I got a friend, um, Naoki, um, at NCAR translated for me. So this plot is temperature, this plot is wind. And what you're saying here is cumulative precipitation in the dashed line, and the black line is accumulated snow. You can see here at, um, at temperatures that are, are quite cold. So over here, this is temperature. You are getting a fraction of the cumulated precipitation actually intercepted in the tree. And here with temperatures just slightly below freezing, it's actually mining conditions, you're actually getting more snow intercepted in the tree than you're measuring in your precipitation. Um, that's kind of what was happening in that like Tahoe picture. And if you make a plot of the ratio of the intercepted snow, snow weight to the, the total snowfall you weigh, um, you get this, this nice plot that shows a rapid, rapid increase with storm temperature. So winter temperatures are a very good index of how much snow your, your trees can intercept. Um, you can also see this, um, studies of snow on boards also show more interception, more snow will accumulate on your board at warmer temperatures. And so on the left, the graph here is by um, Kobayashi, another Japanese study in 1987. And for some reason, temperature is colder on the right, warmer on the left of this graph. Um, these are boards of different thicknesses, 0.5 to 2 centimeters boards. And you can see down here as you get to a negative three degrees Celsius, close, as you approach zero, your interception efficiency goes way up. Um, Pfister and Schneebly working in Switzerland also showed the same results, about four times more snow stuck to their boards at temperatures above negative three degrees Celsius, which you can explain due to increased cohesion, right? Stickiness of the snow. Okay, so just to summarize again, accumulation matters. Um, snow interception, we know there's more snow interception at warmer temperatures due to cohesion. There's also more melt loss at warmer temperatures. So rather than you could get snow in your tree, then it just falls off, right? But it, it's the same as just accumulating the snow under the tree. It just took a little longer to get there, right? You didn't lose anything. Um, but if you get snow stuck on the tree and then it melts faster than snow anywhere else, that snow is essentially lost to drip. Um, and the picture here, this is of our site in the Cedar River watershed. and when we were doing field work out there, I always had to bring my rain hat to do winter field hat because the trees would just drift on my head all winter long. It's kind of miserable. Uh, all right, so um, one more, more summary because I know that was a, a lot to throw at you pretty fast. Um, so accumulation patterns are linked to winter temperatures. It wasn't the first thought I had, right? I wanted to use winter temperatures explain melt energy balance. That was my first inclination. But it turns out that accumulation is the dominant signal in what we're seeing and that accumulation patterns are linked to winter temperatures. So snow interception, you have more interception at warmer temperatures due to increased cohesion, more melt loss at warmer temperatures. You also have trees that tend to act like a snow fence and colder places are likely windier with sparser forests that are windier and colder snow is less cohesive, same story, so more subject to wind redistribution. Um, but the conclusions of you know, what we know are just based on, on the evidence before I jump into how you model it all. Um, forest snow and runoff have been studied for, for over a century. Um, there's some great historic 
papers um, in the early 1900s talking about this. Um, the fundamental effect of forests on snow runoff timing can flip direction, which is important to consider if you are trying to do any study analyzing forest change, snow change, and climate or weather change. Um, you need to make sure that whatever modeling system you set up can actually represent these changes in the relationships. Um, you need to make sure that if you're having warmer winters, snow will last longer in the open. Colder winters, snow lasts longer in the forest. A any questions just on sort of the, the whys and the observational story before we get into what do you code to actually make your computer do this? Yes, make it. Um, one question, where would you put like a temperature split on like warmer versus colder winters? Um, it's blah, 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 early, early pictures right here. Um, basically, it's, it's right, right up close to that negative degree. It's the same as a cohesion story. Okay. Okay. We're going to see right, right through here. I mean, there's also some in the middle where there's no difference, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. What about differences in albedo between the two different types of snow? Um. Yeah. So what you could see from um from the movie, right? You could see the leaf litter or forest needle litter falling on the snow um, underneath the um, underneath the forest Olympic site. So typically snow under a forest is a little bit dirtier. However, also because the trees are attenuating the solar radiation, the relative importance of albedo tends to be a little bit less under the trees than in the open. So it, it's not a dominant effect. Um, and actually in the 2013 paper, I looked at that quite a bit um, and found that the leaf litter wasn't a wasn't a dominant effect. Now, if you are thinking about burn forest and foot and char falling off some, you know, trees standing there, then you don't have the trees blocking the radiation, and you also can have a lot of like carbon sitting on the top. So it can become dominant in in that effect. And Kelly Gleason has some nice papers talking about that. So sort of forest snow albedo right after your forest burned becomes a more dominant effect there. For a healthy forest. Okay not a first order effect it's a small small effect but it's a big question um, i guess i was thinking about it in terms more of like grain size with warmer snow versus colder snow so the warmer snow has definitely a larger grain size which does have an albedo effect but again its effect is smaller compared to all of the other effects if that makes make sense and and the leaf litter of impact of the albedo is larger than the grain size impact on the albedo. I'm going to just take 9 million processes and break them for most of the least important so your brain can decide what to focus on, what I'm often doing. All right. Other questions before we, we jump into modeling? I just wanted to follow up on the, on the temperature split question. Mm -hmm. Is that, that minus three degrees? Is that, um like daytime average or 24 hour average what yeah, does that might represent it was very coarse i mean we we felt like we didn't have really good temperature data at most of the studies in that paper and so we just used daily average mean temperature for three months out of the climatology okay mm -hmm. thanks yeah you're welcome um, Susan's paper, she she does plot like the temperature in individual years as well. She looked at a little bit finer, but the results didn't change. All right, so now now that we know all about our processes and what we should have in our model, now we got to do the nitty gritty of actually coding and running our model. And we're going to see if we can simulate the snow under the trees and in the open that Pascal Stork observed. Um, here, is, this is a picture by Kale Martin. Um, this is in the Cedar River watershed in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you probably, many of you like snow and trees, you've probably seen sunlight coming through the trees is super pretty. All right. So as I mentioned last time, a um, few things to think about in terms of met data and forested sites, right, is that SUMA expects our forcing data 
to be available at, above the top of our forest. Um, most of our data in most places, including Pascal's place, is taken in a forest clearing. So, um, so the first thing we need to think about is extrapolating data from the clearing to above the forest top. So revisiting Monday's discussion, um, what do people think are issues we should worry about here? Wind speeds might be very different at the two heights. Yeah, likely they are very different. Mm -hmm. What else, besides them just being, being different? Anything else we might be concerned about? You might also worry how clear is your clearing, right? Thinking about like those pictures, that all forest openings weren't created the same. Um, most of the metadata expects it to really be an opening and sometimes of course clearing actually is very sheltered. And so it, you might be, it might be even more, follow up on Sarah said, even more di different than you initially thought. Um, but let's, let's think about how we do it. Okay, so this is a picture um, that Pascal Stark put together in his thesis, which I also posted because it's kind of hard to find his original thesis, but it actually, if you're interested in this, it's, it's a more thorough, complete write-up than um, most of the published papers, and it's one of my, my favorite things to read along with the Japanese work on this subject. So um, Pascal made this great drawing of all the processes happening with forest and snow and everything he had to think about at his site where you're, you're going to model for your homework. Um, so, so the first thing, just to follow on what we did last week, and this is, um, this is what you'll see in homework 1C, which you don't have to do and turn in, but it's more an example just to learn how to do things, um, is you know, most of the measurements are taken at about two meter height. You remember from last time we got the output from SUMA, it said three meters was what was um, listed of where Pascal measured it. Um, and then we have some reference height for our model force. And we, write, we need something much, much higher up here because the model needs something above the canopy. So um, what Pascal has drawn here is an open wind canopy profile and then a canopy wind profile, right? He showed that what we would expect, winds are gonna be faster above the canopy than down below the canopy, right? It's part of how the tree wind fence thing works. So, so what we need to do in model world is we need to extrapolate the wind to what we think it is above the canopy, assuming a logarithmic profile. And then that becomes our reference height model forcing. We give that to the model, and then we let the model extrapolate it back down to the forest. So this is in the model code. This is in the pre-processing for the model code. All right, so let's let's quick take a look. This is what I showed last time. And we, we saw here that um, for our two sites we're gonna look at, we have the grassland, that's the open, we have the evergreen broadleaf forest, and we have the measurement height down here is at three meters and 15 meters. Okay, so, so the next thing you probably ask is, okay, she said to scale the wind logarithmically. How on earth do you scale the wind logarithmically? So I'm, I'm just gonna walk you through how I approach this kind of problem. The first thing I do is I Google, how do you scale wind logarithmically, right? So then you get Wikipedia. It says log wind profile. So you go on Wikipedia and it tells you, okay, to estimate the wind wind speed at one height, Z2, based to another Z1, the formula should be right here, um, where um, U is the mean wind speed at height Z with the respective subscripts. So we know Pascal measured wind at height Z1. We have that. We need it above the canopy at height Z2. So then the next thing you do is, okay, what are all these other things that are thrown in this formula? D is the zero plane displacement. So that is the height in meters at which zero wind speed is achieved. This would basically be the height of the snow surface in the open. It's more complicated over the vegetation and there are a lot of disagreements about what it will be. But let's say we're gonna take it in the open and just scale it to wind speed in the open. Um, Z naught is the roughness length. Um, that's saying what you're measuring. Uh, the wind above, how, how rough is it? Snow is relatively smooth, so it has a fairly small value. If you had a cornfield or something, it would be a little bit higher because um, you would have the corn bend and 
slow down the wind more um, on the way. All right. Okay. So now we can, um, this is my modifications. If you're looking at homework 1C, exercise 1, that's IPython notebook, which you copied over, um, you'll see it gets to, it's to a point where it says we need to change the wind speed. What I have here is actually not in it. This is me just typing code in Python based on what I, I just found. Okay, so if we, we know our model expects our wind to be at three meters in the clearing and at 15 meters above the canopy, we, we need to apply a log scale, right? So Z2 is 15, Z1 is three. Then we need to think, okay, what are reasonable numbers for our site for the other parameters we have here, right? The displacement height D, I said maybe it's the average height of the snow. And I looked at Pascal's observations. It looked like the snow most of the winter was about 150 millimeters. And at 40% density, which is an average density Pacific Northwest, I would make the depth of the snow in meters be 0.15 times one divided by 0.4. Typical roughness for snow. So you can you could then change all this, right? The plus with computer code is you could change any one of my assumptions and see how much it matters, right? How much does it change the number we might get? And then have a log multiplier um, where I just plugging in the formula, printing it out, I get 1.3. Um, you'll also note that if you, you don't look up these displacement height and roughness lengths, and you just said, I'm just gonna take the ratio of the logs, you would actually get 2.5. So that's what I've got right here. Um, so let's put a few sticky notes on this. So um, you will note when you look at the notebook that you copied over, it says that the correct multiplier is 1.6. Um, this is because um, that number was calculated when the model thought there were different measurement heights and assumptions uh, about D and Z0. Um, and because Bart and Andrew were helping me with this, they, they got it from last year and it's not updated. So 1.6, is not exactly right. However, the code, you can change that 1.6 to anything you want, okay? Um, it's also, you know, it's an example. So in terms of just an example of code, it works fine. Um, also note that if you just take the ratio of the logs without worrying about boundary layer theory, you just get 2.5. And you are invited to try this. And I will tell you that doing that actually makes the simulation look a lot better. So question. If you're playing with this and you're like, oh, all these things, I make up these numbers, and 1.6 look good, 2.5 look better, Jessica says, based on boundary layer theory, it really should be 1.3. What, what's right? Any idea? Did you just go with the number that made the snow look the best? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Nobody's sure. I'm not going to go with the are not commenting. Any questions? It sort of suggests that there's something else wrong somewhere else, doesn't it? Yeah, remember I said that the, the amazing thing about modeling is two wrongs can make a right lots and lots of times. Um, you, should, you should always think twice before tuning one number until you get the exact right answer because if you are only tuning, you can tune lots of these numbers to get the right answer. And you want to think about what other reasons do I have to set this number as well. Okay, so my feeling is that I actually don't think boundary layer theory applies very well in forests. So I don't know if that's true. I don't know if any of these are true, but um, you should at least be aware that, you know, this is kind of a range they fall in. And um, and something else might be wrong as well. So let me show you what else you might think about. All right, so remember what we just did and what you're gonna do in the homework 1C. We took our measurement um, at about two, it's a three in this case, extrapolate it, we think winds above the canopy. Then note, we let the model extrapolate back down to the forest. Might be worth thinking, well, what is the model doing, right? How is the model extrapolating it back down in the forest? Because if I put it up here too high and then it extrapolates it too low, right? You could definitely, this is a pretty circular route, you could get two wrongs making a right lots of times. So here is um, just following through on that thought process. So wind attenuation through the canopy turns out it's a tunable parameter. Um, in SUMA, this parameter, if you go look at that long parameter list of what is it, is called the wind reduction parameter. 
you can choose whether it has a shape that's logarithmic or exponential form based on what you think is right. You can also set what is called this wind, wind reduction factor, which is shown as W here, to different values. What values might you want to know, use, if you go and read the literature? Um, turns out that um, Mahat, who was uh, working with Turbotton on the UEB, was working at Niwat Ridge and said you should use a value of 0 0.06. Niu and Yang, who did NOAA MP, said the default value should be 0 0.20. And then Mahat said that a general conifer should have a value of 0 0.10. So if I use a logarithmic profile and I just wanted to know what difference does this make, if I assume I had an 11 meter high canopy that's similar to the height at Pascal Stork site with five meters per second winds at canopy height, what would I say the winds were at the surface of the forest? Um, would vary by about a factor of two depending on how I set this up. So I could change things both in scaling more wind at the top or in scaling more or less wind at the bottom. I think in this particular case, it, we probably don't have enough data to say which is right or wrong, but you should be aware that there are multiple paths to get the wind under the canopy to be what you want. The other process to think about is, oh, okay, I'm, going down a rabbit hole is going back to the first thing, what's in the ranking of all the problems we have? What are the big numbers? What are the small numbers, right? Does this make a big difference on what I want to know about? So if I wanna know about snow, um, turns out that at Pascal's site, if you play with that module, you will see that the winds change the below canopy melt a lot. So, um, so basically the clearing are the blue lines here, um, observations and the model. And um, the black dash line is observations in the forest. And by letting more wind go below the canopy, I can melt snow under the canopy just by changing the wind and nothing else. So it turns out for this particular site, it matters a lot. For other sites, it does not matter as much. Um, that's another question, where are you working? Different things will matter, different places. Um, so these all four have all the same interception parameterizations. The only difference between, between these lines, which is the, the red, pink, um, green, and dashed red, all these, particularly with this February event here, is how much, um, how much wind reduction there was under the canopy. Um, this is from the paper you read. Um, again, um, Martin is showing that this is just changing the logarithmic and exponential profile, and um, you can get, you know, melt of snow with just a, more winds. Um, you can wipe out your snow depth under the canopy. All right, so um, this is sort of the way the class is going. If you are interested, if you, have, if you have, say I have a site with no trees, I could care less, you can not have to work on this anymore. If you're working, a number of you said we really are interested in vegetation and snow, and you think wind and trees and snow might be a fun project, how would you proceed? Um, you wanna go look at the PySuma how-to my Python notebook. And um, it shows you how to actually plot out what the decisions are in Suma and what are the available options for a given decision and how you can change in between two decisions. So what you see at the top with the snow interception decision is what, what Bart and Andrew set up for you I added, just for example here, what you might do if you wanted to play with the wind profile. You could just print decisions, wind profile, print decisions, vegetation traits. Um, you can see in each one of these, there are um, a number of different methods. These are collections of methods from different models. So again, thinking back to the paper you read, you know, Martin's idea here is let's have a master template where you can actually objectively check decisions made by different modelers in different models. So most models you pick up might text your brain less than what I'm making you do right here, but most of them, they will choose something for you. They will just say, there's a logarithmic profile below the canopy. There's an exponential. It's just set in stone. You're not supposed to look at it or think of it ever again. Here, we want you to actually think about it. Like, does it make a difference for my site? Is one better or not better? How, how should I pick? Um, if I'm using another model that has it hard coded, is that the right model for me? Can I objectively check that decision? Because as I, I mentioned 
before, there's multiple ways they could together make a right, they could each be wrong. And there are very few places we have good wins, both below and above a canopy to actually say what the right approach is here. Um, so you, something, if your place is sensitive to it, you might want to think about the sensitivity analysis. Um, the other thing to think about is you're changing these. Each has basically a decision. So the decision is basically a formula, generally empirical formula that somebody put in their model. And they're, you know, here are three different decisions that three different people put in their model. But each of those give you sort of a functional shape. So the shape in terms of the canopy wins would be exponential versus logarithmic below the canopy. Now for that shape of a function, you also have a parameter of the steepness of that function, right? So there's a functional form and then there's a parameter that changes it. And so you can look at that. So um, you can look at the wind reduction parameter um, and here's how you would print it out, print the wind reduction parameter and you can change it. So you can see what it was, was 0.95. That's attenuating almost all the wind. The reason the snow wasn't melting, there was no wind at all below the forest. You could change it dramatically, 0.04. You could say that the Mahat paper, or the new and Yang paper I showed you had the exact right number and change it to that. And then you can see how much doing that, making that choice changes the winds at the canopy floor and then the turbulence that's available to melt the snow. Any, any questions on that thought process of how you go in and change things in the model? Looks okay. If, if questions come up once you start doing it, just send me a note, post on the discussion. I find a lot of these, you, you don't know you have a question until you start typing in the code yourself, is my experience. Okay. All right, so um, so let's go through, we went, we went through an overview of trees and snow. Now let's review forest interception processes as represented in a model, right? So every time we do a model, we start with, um, as as you tried to do on your homework due today, or we'll try to do before you go to sleep tonight, um, it, draw a picture, right? So what's our picture of snow interception? So my picture is, okay, I have a tree, right? And it's, I like evergreen trees, so that's what I have. I have precipitation, it's made up of rain plus snow. Precipitation falls. Um, there's some interception efficiency, right? How much gets stuck in the tree? And then there's a rule built into all these models that says that the tree cannot intercept more snow than IMAX, right? That's the maximum amount of snow this tree can hold. So snow is intercepted by the tree up to some maximum it can hold called IMAX. That's a parameter we get the tree. Um, when you have snow and you can have snow in the tree in a solid form or a liquid form, right? It could melt, it could freeze. You could have this this uh, frozen and liquid water in the tree evaporate or sublimate, right? And it's gonna leave the system through evaporation. You could have it fall out of the tree. It could melt and drip out of the tree, or it could be a solid clump of snow that sort of sloughs out of the tree. We'll call that unloading. And then if we wanna track what's happening, um, we're gonna track you know, the change in snow below the canopy, the change of snow in the canopy is a function of the interception efficiency times the precipitation minus evaporative losses minus unloading. And the snow beneath the canopy is you know, one minus whatever got intercepted of the precip fell down there, um, plus whatever solid snow unloaded minus whatever snow melted minus whatever snow sublimated, right? So these are a way to draw a picture of the modeling system. Then you can go start looking at, all right, now we need some equations to fill in for these. So for, for the first one, let's focus just on this parameter I told you that is maximum interception, IMAX. And I think you, you saw this one is in the paper as well. So the amount varies both by model and by temperature. So you can see here that um, as a function of air temperature, degree C, and I have low temperatures on the left, higher temperatures on the right, that um, there's one model developed by Hedstrom and Pomeroy in 1998 that say there's you know, some amount and it decreases as temperatures get warming. And there's another one, um, which is developed by uh, Costas Andreas based on most of the work by Pascal Stork. And he says that 
is about the same till you get to negative three, and then there's a very rapid increase, and then um, it stays constant again. All right, so, so the next thing, you see, I've got these two choices. Next thing I try to do when Facebook teachers say, well, where did they come from? Why is there a difference? And um, this goes back to, if you remember on the first day, I showed you um, the quote by the guy who said that, you know, people develop this parental affection of, for their models and it gets passed on for reasons that may or may not have anything to do with actual validity of that model choice. Um, that parental affection, you can also see in what I call model family trees. All right, so here, here's the story of where these things came from. So in um, 1991, Schmidt and Glunz, and you can read the paper, they were looking at snow on a branch. They actually had a pole and they had clipped a bunch of branches to this pole and they were looking at what happened to snow on the branches. And they were particularly looking at snow bouncing off the branches. And they found that at temperatures less than negative three C, they were only looking at temperatures less than negative three C. As snow's specific gravity increased, the bouncing of particles increased, the snow got bouncier, and interception decreased. At the same time, in 1990, Schmidt and Pomeroy were looking at branch stiffness. They found that when branches got really cold, they froze, they didn't bend much, and that branches bend much more easily at warmer temperatures, right? You could see my Pacific Northwest tree in that movie, the branches were bending a whole lot. Now, at the same time, um, Kobayashi over in Japan, not talking to these guys, they were in Canada, um, was looking at snow on boards. I showed you his study, and now, some, sorry, let's go back here. Um, so um, below negative three degrees C, snow crystals were bouncing, but between negative three and zero degrees C, there was an increase in the cohesion adhesion of ice, and so you got increased board interception. Okay, so what happened after that? All right, so, in 1998, Hedstrom and Pomeroy, so you can see kind of the family of which researchers work together, they formulated their interception parameter for their model as a function of density. Density is hard to measure, so they decided to parameterize it by temperature. And they cited Schmidt and Glunz, who said that at colder temperatures, snow got bouncier. Same time, um, Pascal Stork, that's the site you're gonna be modeling, he was weighing his Doug fur in Oregon, I showed you the picture, and he noted that the maximum interception decreased by a factor of four in one very cold event when the temperature was less than negative five degrees C. It's a pretty warm site, it was almost never that cold. So Andreas was told to put what Stork did into VIC and DHSVM. So he took the Stork factor of four from this one event, and then he took the Kobayashi temperature values between negative three and zero, and he decided there was a linear increase in maximum interception. Everybody follow? This is how models are actually developed. It's like watching sausage be made. All right, so then what happened was it turned out that um, Hedstrom and Pomeroy were much better at marketing than Pascal Stork was. Pascal Stork actually got tired of academia, invented his own company called Three Tier, and um, stopped going to meetings. Meanwhile, um, Hedstrom and Pomeroy uh, created a, a giant center in Canada. So you'll see that their method now appears in the Visa model, as cited by Niu and Yang the class model by Bartlett et al., Mahatan Tarbatan's UEB model, and Pomeroy's model, the CRIM model. You can then see that the NOAA MP model is based on the VISA model. So they just took all the code from that and ported it over to their model. And then um, Clark et al., the SUMA model, what we have, tried to be representative of as many things as he could, and so pulled from, besides the NOAA MP model, the UEB model, and the VIC and GHSVM model. So he has two choices. But a lot of models don't. Again, it's hard coded and you have to go back. You have to actually be a rather obsessive compulsive uh, paper reading detective to say, okay, well, where did it come from? Who are they citing? Well, where are they coming? And you find that all the interception in all the interception parameters in all of our models go back to this one tree in Oregon and some branches clipped to a pole. It's kind of scary. We should get some more observations, but we're doing modeling, so we're not going to worry about that. All right, so summary, why why the difference, right? Um, all these people were were good scientists, and um, they were they they were trying to do diligence. So um, big difference is that 
there really is, this is what in SUMA is labeled the light snow versus the sticky snow parameter, and you can change the two of them. And so the Andreas et al. equation was based and tested in warm regions. This is used in the VIC and the DHSVM models. They are applied globally, and it predicts a large increase in the amount of snow a tree can hold as temperatures warm. That's this one right here with the black. The Hedstrom and Palmer equation is based and tested in cold regions. It is used in most global models, including most climate change models, and it predicts a slight decrease in the amount of snow a tree can hold as temperatures warm. So they're, they're both right, in a sense, in different temperature regimes. It, it is true, when you think about snowflake microphysics, that um, dendrites, which are big, fancy snowflakes, um, bridge snow branches better than columns, and these columns and prisms are likely to be bouncier um, than, than the dendrites. Um, and so here's temperature. And so you see actually like the shapes and composition of snow change. Um, they're, they're not right, both right though, in this negative three regime. The observations in the negative three regime are about the cohesion, which is more dramatic than just the shapes of the snowflake. But if you only worked in a cold environment and never measured warm snow, it might not cross your mind. Um, so here again is from the, the paper you read, figure five. Um, and you'll notice something else here that you know they the observations are in um are in the gray, and you'll notice that the Hedstrom and Pomeroy and the Andreas et al. models, they, they don't the, one doesn't look dramatically better than the other in terms of their performance. But you will notice that they actually change dramatically based on what you set as the branch capacity. So again, this is what I was showing you with the winds, is that there's there's the functional form, right? There's the shape of the curve you put in, but then there's the parameter you put in that changes that curve. Does that make sense? So if you pick very different parameters, so if we just look at this event right here, the biggest one in the gray, you can see that for the Hezra and Pomeroy, the branch capacity that gives you the best answer is this red one, which says that the branch can hold 13.2 millimeters. And over here in Andreas, the branch capacity that says you can hold it actually is five millimeters. So the, the blue line looks better. So you can tune things to work at any given space. The problem is it is not going to be transferable to another place because you are just tuning values and what on earth does branch capacity mean anymore, right? This is the same tree. Um, so you, you want to think about as you're using and developing models of what, what are the physics we know and can we get parameters that actually are based on something we can measure? Because if we have too many that are tunable, we all just get frustrated it becomes hard to make progress. Um, so with, with that in mind, um, you know, one one reason. Oh no. Okay, I'm just gonna call them back later. I have an amazing ability to attract phone calls about my children during while teaching you guys. Um, so, um, so basically, um, basically, Nu and Yang, who did the NOMP model, they used Hedstrom and Pomeroy's formula with Pascal Stork's data. So you would think that wouldn't work best, right? Like this is the warm snow environment and they're using the cold snow parameterization and shouldn't they have some problem? They made it look very good. And the reason is you can just tune the parameter. You can just tweak that parameter till it matches your one spot. The problem is it doesn't, it's not transferable. Um, and there's so little data to check it against that they just said, here's the parameter for Pascal's site. Here's the parameter for John Palmer's site and not just two sites, it's now all global climate models every time. So, so here with your modeling, you could check. You could say, well, how much does this matter? And if I warm the world or change things, how does it change? Um, and this is just one more plot that says, you know, depending on which of these equations, you need very different parameter sets for the same result. And the best fitting parameter sets vary by more than a factor of four for the same physical trees. We would hope our parameter set might be based on something actually about the shape or density of the tree or something objective. So this could be another fun project. Um, this is an example, you can change snow interception to sticky snow or light snow, and then you can 
change what that interception capacity is. Um, also, just in looking at this and what I've showed you so far, um, we, we can run sensitivity analysis and hold off judgment. Um, or should what should we do? We have in the whole modeling tree one model that really shows interception increasing with temperature, and most models really show interception decreasing with temperature. So, so what do you think? Does popularity equal the correct choice, or should we just average all the models we have together in a multi-model ensemble? Sounds like more studies are needed. <laughs> I should go observe things under trees, right? <laughs> yeah. do, do you think more studies are, are needed on this particular case? I mean, there's more studies needed in general for modeling storage, for, for much study. That I 100% agree with. But in terms of just picking between these two. Um, I guess based on the history, it does sound like they're based on one tree and a couple branches, right? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue, I'm going to argue that um, I think all models should convert. And this is Jessica, the Jessica's opinion, but written up here, and you can decide. But I think that all models should increase interception efficiency with temperature because this is actually this particular one not all things there's a lot i throw up my hands and say i don't know like the wind profiles i'm just going to throw up my hands this particular case i'm going to argue that this is a well documented and observed feature that's grounded in a physical understanding that we have known for over 50 years so i just want to return to what i was showing you in the like general state of snow and trees is that we have we have two different studies with boards where they showed a rapid accumulation in rapid increase in accumulation efficiency at negative 3C. Um, both showed a factor of four times, actually. We also have people who are weighing actual trees in Japan. So these two studies, so the Kobayashi was cited by one of the models. These two were not cited by any of the models. Um, and they actually agree pretty strongly with them, just showing the same exact results that there is an increases intercept snow traction as temperatures approach zero degrees. Um, also, this, this is another great paper. This is Karoya 1967, where in a lab, they just sprinkled snow at different temperatures in a controlled laboratory and saw how tall you could get your snow pile to go based on the cohesivity of snow. They also did tests that were just based on cohesive forces, so very basic physics as a function of temperature. And again, at these warmer temperatures, you get close to zero, the physics of the cohesion changes. And we, we know this based on fundamental principles. So it's not that there, but the thing to think about with modeling is, right, there are the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. There's things that are just made up parameters. There are things that actually, if you dig and look, we actually have evidence that's very, very cohesive. Uh, of my cohesive snow pun here. Right, angle of repose case of course is increased with warmer temperatures. Also, Roth and Nolan were just looking at interception efficiency as a function of storm temperature. And you can see, so higher numbers here, interception efficiency. Warm was pretty close to one, whereas colder was always less. There, there's no observational evidence anywhere that shows that the opposite is, is true. The other one was basically Right here, this this was just based on a lack of observations in this region. They actually looked identical in the area they both had observations, and the one that had observations in this region matches all other observations in this region. So I would argue for this particular case, and um, you can you can come to your own conclusion, but I would argue that in this case, uh, popularity does not win, and the research supports the one outlier model. Um, so um, in our five minutes left before I go rescue the sick kid of the day, um, another fun thing to play with um, is when does snow fall out of the tree, right? How much snow do we get? But then how long does it stay in the tree? One of the largest problems of climate modeling is that we never get the albedo right in the boreal forest. And that's because none of the models we have are actually very good at keeping the right amount of snow in the trees for the right amount of time in the boreal forest. You can't model interception and unloading. You can't calculate um, albedo of a combined snow tree area. So just to review our conceptual model, snow in the tree might sublimate, might melt and drip off. It might slough off 
and unload. And just similar to what we could do for the um, what we could do for the interception amounts, we can also make a family tree of modeling snow unloading. Um, you can see this is my favorite way to do literature reviews is just figure out which paper is related to which paper. So this is a lot. So let's simplify it a lot with some color schemes. Okay, so um, so in terms of unloading, um, the first thing is there's a bit more diversity in the model heritage. There were sort of just two choices in that interception amount. Um, and th there's more things going on in how models are unloading snow. Um, so what you have is a SUMA model and it contains two options. It has one based on, again, this is Pascal Stork, back to the century, there aren't that many. Um, Notice that about 40% of the snow was unloaded with meltwater drip. So that was his observations based on two years on this one tree he measured in Oregon. Um, so Richard Esri put that in the Jules model. Andreas, who was um, from the same research group as Pascal, put it in the Vic and the DHSCM model. Um, that ended up in um, the SUMA model. Hedstrom and Pomeroy, again, working much colder environment, um, presented an exponential decay function for how snow unloaded. And if you read their paper, they say they fit 59 estimates for seven days after snowfall to an exponential curve and found that C equals 0 0.678. They didn't have any graphs. And when I asked um, John where that came from, he said he didn't know where it was. Um, but this one is used in um, the class model. It's also used in CRIM. There's an update in the CRIM though, in the paper by Gelfin in 2004, they noted that when the air temperature got above zero degrees C, right, it started melting, all the snow was unloaded. Once you lubricate it, it all, all falls off. And then this method right here without the zero degree C part was then adopted in the UEB model. So it's based on the first one, but it doesn't match the other sibling of this parent tree because they didn't get the update into that one. All right, now, um, this is another interesting one in terms of family history. So the Bartlett model actually started using Hester and Pomeroy, decided they didn't like it, and they dumped it and moved over to another line. So in 2001, um, Roche et al. wanted a better way to represent the fractional snow cover and albedo over forests. So remember I was telling you that the boreal forests are so problematic they can't get the albedo right. This is a lot of climate modelers are worrying about this. And um, and so they, they said, you know what, what we've got over here isn't really helping us. Um, it just doesn't work. We need something else. What are we going to go for? So I like this paper. It's pretty creative. So um, they went and they found a paper by Nakai et al. who were weighing a total flora in Sapporo, Japan, study sublimation. And they noted that snow rapidly unloads at air temperatures greater than zero. Uh, this, this line actually, Gelfin came to the same conclusion. So two people observed that's now in two models. Um, Betts and Ball were looking at albedo in boreal forest canopies. And they noticed there never ever was high albedo at wind speeds greater than five meters per second. So Roche et al said, okay, that means that if wind goes above, above five meters per second, we gotta blow all the snow out of the canopy. So they decided to grab that number. Also Miller, 1962, noted that snow interception was less when winds were greater than two meters per second. And Yamazaki in 1996, measured albedo over forest in Japan and noticed that as long as air temperature, that unloading increased with both higher winds and air temperature greater than zero. So Roche et al. formulated that they would have unloading be both a function of temperature, melting and slipping, and as a function of wind. They are actually the only one that has wind. SUMA currently doesn't have wind. So we're working on putting the Roche parameterization in SUMA. The other nice thing about SUMA being a modular format is you go find a parameter you like better than all the ones that are choices in there you can add it, it's one more, right? It's designed to be modular. You say, okay, we'll take that one. You come up with your new best parameter for whatever, you can port it in there. Um, this one then um, got adopted by the updated version of class, the 2015 version, also went into the VISA model, which the VISA model was then adapted to the NOAA NP model and the CLN model. And with that, you now have had more model family trees than anyone should have to have in a day. So um, you have one minute for questions. Okay. Let's go. All right. Okay. So we'll just any questions? Completely saturated with forest snow facts. 
All right, I will stop recording.